Good morning, King's Church. I hope you're well and rested as we meet together this morning. My name is Lawrence and I'll be hosting our time together. If it's your first time joining with us this morning, then you're especially welcome. In a moment, I'm going to hand over to Tress and Lauren, who are going to lead us in our sung worship, before Aid comes to continue speaking on the person of Jesus from the book of John. But before I hand over to Tress and Lauren, I'd just like to share a psalm with you. This is from Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise, for the Lord is a great God. Can I encourage you, whether you're watching alone at home this morning or as a family, to really engage with this time with God. Make your praises known to him. Maybe make a noise, maybe even get up and dance. Let's all be loud before him as we come with thanksgiving. Let me pray before we begin. Lord, I am so pleased that you are with us, whether we're gathered or separated this morning. I thank you that you are with every one of us at this moment. Help us now to engage in a time of worship for and to you, because you are worthy of our praise and adoration. In Jesus' name, Amen.
Thank you, Tris and Lauren. A couple of notices this morning and then a book recommendation to help you in your individual study during lockdown. Firstly, I'd like to thank you, Church, for your prayers leading up to the start of the 321 course on Tuesday. For those joining us for the first time this week, 321 is a short three week course to explore the Christian faith. It was a great evening with some deep conversations. I was really excited and grateful to God for the opportunity to share this course online. It's still possible to start the course, so for anyone who would like to join us this coming Tuesday, there's a link on our website banner at kingschurchupfield.org.uk where you can contact us for details. The second notice is to announce the launch of an exciting new opportunity for the community of Uckfield and the surrounding villages. A little while ago, Leslie Root shared about how we could serve our community in a very practical way, a very spiritual way, by offering the opportunity to pray for people as a church. So today I am thrilled to announce the launch of a prayer portal accessed on our website which will allow anyone who would like to receive prayer to contact us anonymously and in confidence to ask for prayer. We have gathered a small prayer team who will receive specific prayers from people in the community and will be able to pray into situations. As a church, we believe that prayer works. We believe that God hears our prayers and answers them. So if you click on the relevant button on our website banner, you will read all about prayer and also read some testimonies, that's stories about answered prayer from people in the church. So can I encourage you to speak to your friends, neighbours and family about the prayer portal and direct them to the website. There'll be information going out this week on our face page, Facebook page and in the local press. A big thank you to Mel, Tim and Tris for all the narrative and technical support and of course Leslie for inspiring and challenging us to offer prayer to the Upfield community. And finally, a book recommendation. Next week, Aid will be starting a new series of talks from the book of Exodus. Although the words from the Bible, inspired by the Holy Spirit, directly speak and impact us, I find it often useful to have a commentary that somebody else's reflections to aid my understanding. This book, from the Straight to the Heart series, is written by Phil Moore. Many of us will have read and enjoyed other books in this series. This one, called Moses, is a good, solid read that is accessible and relevant to today. It's broken down into 60 manageable sections, and so is also useful as a daily devotional. The focus is on the relationship of God and his people, and it uses the person of Moses to unpack this relationship. Half of the book is devoted to the book of Exodus, and so it's very relevant to our new series starting next week. The other half links to Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, which are the books that follow Exodus and link again to the relationship of Moses, and God. Do consider buying this book, which I think would be a great resource to have. It's available online as a paperback or as a Kindle download. And now over to Aid, who will be closing our current series on the book of John. Aid. Good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to be able to speak to you today, uh, bringing this series on John's Gospel to a close and the passage we'll be focusing on is a suitable <laughs> climax uh, to our series. It's an extraordinary um, episode in the life and times of Jesus. Today I want us to consider this question, does God care? Perhaps you have asked that question before, perhaps you're asking it now, Maybe the current global pandemic has caused you to question, uh, does God actually care about this world, about humanity? Maybe you have been personally affected 
Maybe you know someone who has actually died or been gravely ill or been economically hit by um, the consequences of this unprecedented crisis. Maybe you're asking the question for different reasons. Maybe you're dealing with all manner of challenges in your life or perhaps you've asked that question before. Does God care? And I really believe the passage we'll be looking at today helps us see that yes, God does care. So I'm going to read from the Gospel of John, starting at verse 1 of chapter 11. So if you have a Bible, it would be really useful if you follow through the passage with me. John's Gospel, chapter 11, starting at verse 1. This is a long passage. It's an extraordinary account of a great miracle. Um, some of you will know this very well. It's about Lazarus. I wish in a way I could recreate the first time I heard this or read this because it is breathtaking what Jesus does. So let's read um, the passage, shall we? John's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 1. Now a man named Lazarus was ill. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay ill, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is ill. When he heard this, Jesus said, this illness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you. And yet you were going back? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of his the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is coming to the world. After she had said this, they went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews, who had been with Mary in the house comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept the ma this man from dying? Jesus once more, deeply moved, came to the tomb. 
it was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth round his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. My word, what an incredible uh, and dramatic account of an amazing miracle. In many ways, this is the greatest miracle that Jesus has performed so far in John's Gospel. It's the seventh and uh, he's demonstrated his divinity. He's de demonstrated his authority time and time again by way of healings. Um, providing a multiplication of food to feed the hungry. But this, this is the greatest miracle so far. Someone being raised from the dead. So Jesus knows Lazarus, Mary and Martha well. They're friends of his. He is some way off from uh, their family home and a report is sent to him saying his friend Lazarus is ill. And Jesus knows by way of God showing him that Lazarus uh, will in fact die and he has that sense God given as I say that that's what has happened and he delays returning to Bethany this village by Jerusalem until Lazarus has been dead some time. When he arrives he is greeted by one of Lazarus's sisters a Martha uh, and then he also interacts with the other sister, Mary. He asks where Lazarus has been laid and they tell him he's in the family tomb. Uh, it's evident he wants to go there and I wonder what Mary, Martha and the others are thinking. There's a big crowd of fellow mourners. Perhaps they're suspecting that Jesus just wants to um, go and be near where this friend of his now lies in rest, having died, to pay his respects, to honour him, really. But then Jesus says something quite extraordinary. He says, take away the stone. The stone would be over the mouth of the tomb. It's a cave hewn in rock, and the stone means no one can disturb that sort of place of rest and uh, uh, repose the dead need to be undisturbed. Uh, Martha says, Jesus, to take away the stone means you'll unleash this foul smell. There's a body that's been decomposing for four days. I wonder what these people are thinking of Jesus's instruction to remove the stone. They're going to be perplexed. It, it, it's not in keeping with propriety to have the stone of the tomb moved away. Um, but they do move the stone away and then Jesus speaks in a loud voice doesn't he Lazarus come out and lo and behold the man who was dead is standing at the mouth of the cave albeit still in his grave clothes can you imagine the reaction I'm sure jaws dropped I'm sure eyes were agog I suspect there was for a time a stunned silence as people were rendered speechless maybe in due course <laughs> Uh, there was a, a hubbub of, of whispering uh, and uh, comment from the people looking on. Perhaps there followed spontaneous applause and, and whoops of joy. I suspect Lazarus initially looked around and wondered, what's happened? Uh, was I dead? And now I'm alive? And no doubt the sisters would come to him and hug him and weep <laughs> with tears of joy and perhaps Jesus initially lets them have that moment between them as three siblings but then also comes and, and speaks to his friend who's been recklessly raised from the dead. Perhaps they then go off to the family home for a 
time of quiet reflection <laughs> uh, to celebrate this miracle. Perhaps the crowds in due course disperse to give them that time and space. We don't know because we're not told. We'd like that sort of epilogue, wouldn't we? But it's an incredible story. Uh, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? And I stated at the start of my message this morning, I want us to look at this question, does God care? And you see, I believe from this passage, we see that God does very much care. Jesus said in John 14 verse 9, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So when we talk about Jesus here, when we consider who he, is, who he is and what he does and what he's like, we're actually also talking about God. <laughs> Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus was God made flesh, God as man on this earth. So bear that in mind, that's really important as we think about this question, does God care? I want us to um, home in on three aspects of this incredible passage. There's so much material here, but let's be selective. But nonetheless, I believe we're picking out some key things. There's the miracle, there's the tears, and there's the love. So there's the miracle, clearly there's a great miracle here. Uh, a man being raised from the dead. <laughs> That's front and centre. But there's also Jesus and others, they're weeping. That's important. And I, I put to you, if anything, the most important part of this passage is the love that Jesus had for these people. So the miracle, the tears and the love. This miracle um, is, is stupendous, isn't it? We see that the miracle represents that God... As Jesus, he came to bring life to the dead. Does God care? Yes, he came to bring life to the dead. This miracle is a sign pointing us to something about Jesus. That's what the miracles in John's Gospel are often all about. They're telling us something about Jesus. And Jesus helps us very uh, clearly in the passage itself by saying that he is the resurrection and the life in verse 25. That's what this miracle is about. It's about who Jesus is. It's about what Jesus has come to do. He's come as the one who is the resurrection and the life. The miracle actually points ahead to Jesus' own death and resurrection. That's the greatest miracle in John's Gospel. That comes later. That's what the whole story is building towards. Uh, that's the culmination of John's account. Jesus' own death and resurrection. The miracle of Lazarus being called out of the tomb by Jesus is also an amazing representation of how Jesus calls people out of their spiritual death into spiritual life. Lazarus was dead, <laughs> physically dead, um, and then he's brought back to life. He's given physical life, but it's a picture as well of how Jesus does that for us by way of us being in spiritual death, apart from God, alienated from God, the source of life and Jesus has come to enable us to know God and to know life and he calls us into spiritual life. Jesus calls Lazarus by name if he hadn't have spec if he didn't specify Lazarus's name who knows maybe many many would have been raised to life that day coming out of other tombs and my friend Jesus calls us by name. He knows you, he knows your name, he knows your life and I believe even this morning there'll be some of you tuning in who haven't as yet responded to the wonderful message of Jesus, the one who's come from God, that we might know life where we are otherwise dead. I'm not talking primarily about physical life being restored. I'm talking about you having a sense of your, an awareness of your need to know Jesus, the one who brings spiritual life. Lawrence last week spoke about Jesus as the good shepherd and in John 10 verse 3 it says of Jesus the good shepherd calls his sheep by name and he does do that he does that today if you don't know him he wants to call you by name and if you do know him he wants you to know that he knows your name and it's a wonder and a blessing to be someone who has been brought out of death into life that's the greatest miracle new birth being brought out of death into life so does God care yes he does the miracle shows us that he came to bring life to the dead he came to bring life to the dead and existence a physical existence 
um, enjoying possessions, uh, embarking on a great career, having lovely holidays, enjoying the grandchildren, uh, enjoying your team's sporting success, going to the theatre, <laughs> having a new bit of kit tech-wise. These things aren't wrong necessarily, but my friends, there's far more than just a physical existence. There is this reality available to you to know God, the God who made you. And it's through Jesus that that can happen. So the miracle. Uh, yes, God does care. He has come to bring life to the dead. The tears. Well, God has entered into our brokenness. This episode is about suffering in a broken world. Things aren't right in the world. There is death. There is disease. There is decay. And we see that reality in this story. But you see, Jesus is immersed in this whole sense of brokenness, isn't he? How profound that it says of Jesus, as the sisters weep at the loss of their brother, as the crowds around them also mourn in that way, shedding tears. It says in verse 35 that Jesus wept. Jesus wept. That's his response. Why did he weep? He wept because he felt their pain. He wept because he understood their grief. And he wept because he realised their loss was profound and he experienced those feelings himself in his humanity because he loved this man. He was friends with this man. And it speaks, my friends, of God's heart for this broken world whereby things are not as they should be. There is suffering and God cares about that suffering. And he doesn't just care from afar. He has cared enough to enter in to the suffering of this world. Tim Keller, who is currently living with pancreatic cancer, has said this about the uniqueness of Christianity. He says, only Christianity of all the world's major religions teaches that God came to earth in Jesus Christ and became subject to suffering and death himself. See what this means? Yes, we do not know the reason God allows evil and suffering to continue or why it seems so arbitrary at times but now at least we know what the reason is not it cannot be that he does not love us it cannot be that he does not care he is so committed to our ultimate happiness that he was willing to plunge into the greatest depths of suffering himself Jesus wept because he could see what was wrong with the world he could see that things were not as they should be and he wept because of loss and grief. I wonder if he wept as well because he realised what lay ahead of him. He knew that in due course he would be killed, he would be executed, he would suffer even as no one else because by that means things could be put right. That's the great gospel message. There's a very sobering and inspiring uh, life story that you can read of someone called Johnny Erickson, who as a teenager had a life-changing accident. She dived into shallow water, not realising it wasn't deep enough to actually dive into. And as a result, she was paralysed from the shoulders down. And she's lived like that for over 50 years. And as you can imagine, as a Christian, she wrestled with all that that meant. It was a great challenge for her to understand how this could have happened and why God allowed it um, and what God's purpose might be in it. But she came to a position of understanding that God still cared for her and she could identify through her suffering with the sense of Jesus' suffering on the cross. She realised that God had suffered, even as she has never suffered, nor anyone else could possibly suffer. She says this, Jesus did know what it was like to be able to not to move, not to be able to scratch your nose, shift your weight, wipe your eyes. He was paralysed on the cross. He could not move his arms or legs. Christ knew exactly how I felt. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, 
let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. And that last bit is a quotation from the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. And that's right, God has suffered, even as no one else will ever suffer. He came, entered this broken world and died so that we might know life, so that he might set about putting things right. So the tears, yes, God does care. He has entered into our brokenness. And thirdly, does God care? Yes, the love. He loves us with an unfailing love. So as well as the miracle, as well as the tears, there's the love. <laughs> the love of God revealed in what we read in this account. We see that Jesus loves these three people, Mary, Martha and Lazarus. We're told in verses five and six. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was for two more days. Now that might seem to us very strange, as it did to the people at the time, I'm sure, not least Jesus' disciples. If he loved these people and he had heard that Lazarus was ill, why does he delay? And it's actually because he loves them that he delays. Now Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was for two more days. He does it deliberately, intentionally, because he does love them. That's extraordinary. We would think the opposite, wouldn't we? Would be true. To demonstrate your love, Jesus, get there as fast as you can. And before that man dies, heal him. But no, he delays and he delays because of his love for them. You see, Jesus evidently wants to teach these people something in the process of the pain and perplexity of delay before the glory of the miracle. Let me say that again. Jesus wants to teach these people something in the process of the pain and perplexity of delay before the glory of the miracle. I think he wants to teach these people how to be sure of his love, even in the most heartbreaking and confusing of times. And his focus is really Martha and Mary. And I think the most important bit of the passage is actually this idea of Jesus teaching, especially Martha, who he dialogues with, this really important truth. How to be sure of his love, even when it looks like he's got a funny way of showing his love. So let me reread verses 21 to 27 as Jesus and Martha interact. Martha comes to Jesus as he approaches the village. Verse 21, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. So as I say, I think this is the most important part of the passage. We could easily miss it, couldn't we? We know Jesus loves these people, and yet he delays coming. I'm sure that really confused Mary, who we meet later, but in this case, Martha. Notice what she says to Jesus. She says to him, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, we don't know the tone of voice she uses to say those words, but let me put to you that, in a sense, she's expressing a measure of regret and perhaps lament. Oh, Lord, if you had been here, you could have healed him. He would now be living. So I suspect there is pain behind those words. So lament. 
But then she says in verse 22, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Does she think you could Jesus raise him from the dead? I don't know. But it is an expression of what she knows to be true about Jesus. But I know. So there's emotion with her lament, but there's also here an expression of what she knows in her mind to be true. This is true. I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask, Jesus. And then, after what Jesus says about him being the resurrection and the life, he asks her, do you believe this? Do you believe? And she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. That's a statement of faith. She chooses to believe. Can you see the process here? For this woman dealing with great grief, great pain, she laments, she expresses that pain before Jesus. Oh, if only Jesus. She doesn't deny that. She doesn't think she can't do that. She feels able to do that, to speak in those terms to Jesus as he's right in front of her. Oh, Jesus, because she's grieving the loss of her brother. She laments, but then she acknowledges what she knows to be true. I know, I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. But it's not just something she knows to be true in her mind. She then chooses to believe, to believe in who Jesus is. I believe. And this pattern of lament, of expressing heartache and pain, and then acknowledging the truth about who God is and what he's like, but also moving beyond just an expression of what is known to be true in one's mind, a, a, a decision to believe, that pattern is something we see time and time again in the Psalms of Lament, those songs or prayers in that book in the Old Testament where individuals talk to God and give voice to all they're going through by way of life experience. Let me just read Psalm 143 to highlight, by way of example, this, this dynamic of lament. Oh God, what's happening? Of acknowledging what is true about God. Oh God, I do believe you are good and, and you reign. Uh, or I know it to be true. And then a, a sense of genuine choice to believe these things despite the circumstances. So let me read from Psalm one four three, Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In your faithfulness and righteousness, come to my relief. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one is righteous before you. The enemy pursues me. He crushes me to the ground. He makes me dwell in the darkness like those long dead. So my spirit grows faint within me. My heart within me is dismayed. I remember the days of long ago. I meditate on all your works and consider what your hands have done. I spread out my hands to you. I thirst for you like, like a parched land. Answer me quickly, Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hard hide your face from me, or I will be like those who go down to the pit. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. Rescue me from my enemies, Lord, for I hide yourself, for I hide myself in you. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. For your namesake, Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring me out of trouble. In your unfailing love, silence my enemies. Destroy all my foes, for I am your servant. We don't know the details of this person's experience. It's a psalm of David, by the way. But he's perhaps surrounded by those who intend physical harm, enemies, or who are maligning him and accusing him of things. And he cries out to God. He, he cries out of God by way of the rawness of his um, perplexity and struggles. He connects with God in that way, and it's really legitimate to do that, to say, God, what's going on? Where are you? Why is this happening? And some of you need to hear that. You need to know that you have permission to give voice to your anxiety and your pain and your perplexity. You need to do that. God invites you to connect with him in that way. It's really important to lament. But the psalmist also here, David, as he does that, 
he, he also acknowledges that which he knows to be true. He's heard it, he's um, meditated on it, and in the current maelstrom of this crisis, he gives voice to what he knows to be true. I know that you are good, God. I know that you are watching over me, God. I know that you are sovereign. He expresses that, he verbalises it, because it's important to do that. But it's not just that he speaks it out based on knowledge and understanding. It's something that he chooses to believe despite the circumstances. I choose to believe, oh God, that you're a loving God, that you are faithful. He chooses to believe. And that's what Martha had to do. She had to choose to believe. What about you, my friend? What are you living with at the moment? that's really difficult um, what are you struggling with maybe it's uh, anxiety or stress maybe there are struggles in marriage or parenthood maybe you're dealing with the loss of a loved one maybe you're seeing your child suffer by way of a long-standing illness maybe you find your job and livelihood could be at risk because of the current situation what are you uh, weeping about? What are you trying to find answers for? Are you going to God? Are you lamenting? Are you telling God how you feel? Are you expressing that? Because it's important to. You have permission to. And it's a way of connecting with him. And you need to give voice to know about what you know to be true. Yes, God, you are good. You are faithful and you need to choose to believe that actually God does love you. So as Martha did, we need to be those who actually understand that even in great difficulty, before we see any glory maybe, God does care. God does love us, that we work through how we can be sure of God's love and goodness, even in the face of great anguish. That's what Martha did, that we work through how we can be sure of God's love and goodness, even in the face of great anguish. God does care. God does care for you. He knows you and he loves you. The miracle, he came to bring life to the dead. The tears, he has entered in to our brokenness. The love, he loves us with an unfailing love. Let me pray as I close our time together this morning. It's been so good to um, be able to speak to you. Let me just pray for us, shall I? Thank you, oh God, for this amazing episode. And through it, we see that the God of creation, the God who is in heaven, does care for us. just as Jesus cared for Lazarus and Martha and Mary. And I pray we'd be aware of that this morning, that we can know God's love. Help us to lament, help us to verbalise in prayer what we know to be true, and help us choose to believe. I believe that God loves me. And help us walk through this process of coming to believe that to be true, even in the midst of great, great suffering. Because that's what he led Martha to do. Do it for us, I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.